The first documented use of the conspiracy theory term is found in an American Historical Review article published in 1909, but it wasn't until the 1960s that the conspiracy theory phrase acquired its negative connotations and became commonly used as a derogatory pejorative slur. Conspiracy theory's negative associations can be traced back to political scientist Richard Hofstetter's 1964 article in Harper's Magazine, where he suggested conspiracy theories stem from the paranormal style in American politics. However, it was the CIA who ultimately weaponized the term when it was adopted as the fundamental component in their propaganda campaign to oppose conspiracy theories. In 1967, the CIA essentially weaponized the conspiracy theory term and engaged in information warfare when it sent a detailed memo to all of its bureaus titled Countering Criticisms of the Warren Commission Report, which was the government's official investigation into the JFK assassination. The memo begins with the CIA expressing their concerns, stating that from the day of President Kennedy's assassination on, there has been speculation about the responsibility for his murder in a new wave of books and articles criticizing the commission's findings. Critics speculating as to the existence of some kind of conspiracy implying the Warren Commission was involved and that Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson himself benefited and was in some way responsible for the assassination. Conspiracy theories have frequently thrown suspicion on our own organization because we were directly involved and contributed to the investigation. This trend of opinion is a matter of concern to the US government and our organization because it affects the whole reputation of the American government and casts doubt on the leadership of American society. Despite being marked destroy when no longer needed, the dispatch was released nine years later in response to a New York Times Freedom of Information Act request and is available online. The memo was marked Psych, short for Psychological Operations, or PSYOP, and CS, short for Clandestine Services. The memo outlines a detailed series of actions and techniques to counter and discredit the claims of conspiracy theorists. Its directives include instructing agents to quote, employ propaganda assets to refute the attacks of the critics, adding, book reviews and feature articles are particularly appropriate for this purpose, advising covert assets in the media to ignore conspiracy claims unless discussion is already taking place, and directing agents to remind their friendly elite contacts, especially politicians and editors, of the Warren Commission's integrity and urge them to use their influence to discourage unfounded and irresponsible speculation. CIA Document 1035-960 further outlines additional talking points to counter conspiratorial arguments, stating, the following arguments should be useful. Claim the charges of the critics are without serious foundation and based on unreliable eyewitness testimony. Claim that it would be impossible to conceal such a large scale conspiracy. I don't believe in conspiracies because nobody keeps anything secret. Nobody keeps That's, anything secret. That is That's the right. best uh, defense against conspiracy theories. The biggest problem with conspiracies, uh, particularly government conspiracies, is government bureaucrats are not very competent and they can't keep their mouth shut. There is no conspiracy because people can't keep their mouth shut. Can you actually imagine that our government was capable and then keeping it off of the front page of the New York Times? No. It would be a conspiracy of thousands of people all over the world. Wouldn't it leak? Wouldn't some of those people be eager to talk about it? Wouldn't we in the media love to put it on the front page? Wouldn't it be a big headline? Don't you think that the fact that it's not on the front page means it's probably not true? And they look at me and they just don't believe I don't convince them. If something like this was going on, I promise you, someone would be blowing the whistle. Claim that further speculative discussion only plays into the hands of the opposition. Billionaire businessman Mark Cuban, the owner of the Dallas Mavericks basketball team, is putting up money to distribute a 9-11 conspiracy film. And it's awful, you know that. The film was going to be used by American haters all over the world and decent people should be outraged. Claim that, quote, no significant new evidence has emerged. It's the same old stuff, the same old points, nothing new. If you've got evidence, show us, but there's been no new evidence in right. eight years. Go away. Sorry. Accused theorists of falling in love with their theories. They are too ideologically and I think emotionally satisfying to the people who espouse them. Claim conspiracy theorists are wedded to their theories before the evidence was in. Conspiracy theorists take those facts and unwind them on the basis of an original belief. 
Conspiracy theories work backwards. Accused theorists of being politically motivated. The far left fringe has embraced the conspiracy theory that elements of the U.S. government carried out the attacks on 9-11. It's unbelievable, but that's what they're saying. Why is the far left putting military and all Americans in danger? The left's going to go nuts over it like they did with Michael Moore. All right, I mean, Mr. Liberal, why don't you get to your point instead of being a little snotty, uh, you know, left-wing radical. Go ahead. This is also not a left-right Let's sit down issue. and talk... Uh, Alex, right, right. This is, Alex this is Jones an issue is behind this movie is a, a right-winger, by the way. This is not left-right. Well, well, you're trying to create a partisan wedge to keep people in the partisan left-right paradigm. Accused theorists of being financially motivated. I get that the guys who sell this stuff for a living have a reason to sell this stuff. There's always going to be a very, very, very exciting market for these things. There is money to be made in feeding the ragged edge of America's long-standing conspiratorial mindset. And, you know, I'm sure it's good for business. These guys have a good racket going. It's always the end of the world, but not quite yet. Subscribe for one more month, because then it'll be the end of the world. Only 1995, and yes, you can pay in gold. The government and media continue to rely on the conspiracy theory pejorative label, paired with the PSYOP tactics found in this memo, to dismiss conspiracy allegations to this day. The CIA's strategy to make conspiracy belief a target of ridicule and hostility is arguably the most successful propaganda campaign in modern history. The government's network of covert propaganda assets and friendly elite contacts referenced in this document were partially brought to light in a 1975 congressional investigation into government agencies' intelligence activities. The hearings, known as the Church Committee, were investigating the intelligence activities of the CIA, NSA, and FBI after illegal surveillance activities surfaced during the Watergate scandal. Do you have any people being paid by the CIA, who are contributing to a major circulation American journal. We do have people who submit pieces to other to American journals. Do you have any people paid by the CIA who are working for television networks? This, I think, gets into the kind of uh, getting into the details, Mr. Chairman, that I'd like to get into in executive session. The investigation revealed that the CIA was paying bribe money equivalent to a billion dollars adjusted for inflation under the table to heads of major media companies, editors, and reporters to act as gatekeepers and propagandists for the establishment. The commission's final report determined that, quote, the CIA currently maintains a network of several hundred foreign individuals around the world who provide intelligence for the CIA and at times attempt to influence opinion through the use of covert propaganda. These individuals provide the CIA with direct access to a large number of newspapers, periodicals, scores of press services and news agencies, radio and television stations, commercial book publishers, and other foreign media outlets. In 1977, Pulitzer Prize winner Carl Bernstein shined further light on the CIA's propaganda network in his Rolling Stone article titled, The CIA and the Media. The article exposes how America's most powerful news media worked hand in glove with the CIA and that the church committee actually played a part in covering it up. After leaving the Washington Post, where he uncovered the Watergate scandal with partner Bob Woodward, Carl Bernstein spent six months investigating the relationship between the CIA and the media. His findings revealed that for the last 25 years, the CIA built a network of over 400 covert propaganda paid operatives, secretly spread throughout influential positions in the mainstream media, including the Associated Press, Reuters, UPI, ABC, NBC, Newsweek, and the largest newspaper and magazine publisher, Hearst, adding, quote, by far the most valuable of these associations, according to CIA officials, have been with the New York Times, CBS, and Time Incorporated. At CBS, uh, we uh, had been contacted by the CIA. As a matter of fact, by the time I became the head of the whole news and public affairs operation in 1954, the ships had been established, and I was told about them and asked if I'd carry on with them. The CIA's secret propaganda campaign to manipulate the media came to be known as Operation Mockingbird. Operation Mockingbird, you know, this was a program that uh, the CIA, FBI was inserting operatives within all the major media networks. I mean, we're talking about all of them. Yeah. Papers, publications. My whole question is, is this still going on today? Because they've really permeated throughout the culture of the establishment media. And really, we see the establishment media today, they just parrot the establishment. I'm like, wait, has this gone full circle? Do you say that continues today? Well, I 
Yeah, I would think probably for a reporter it would continue today, but because of all of the revelations of the period of the 1970s, uh, it seems to me that a reporter's got to be much more circumspect in doing it now, or he runs the risk of uh, at least being looked at with considerable disfavor by the public. I think you've got to be much more careful about it. You ask, is this still going on today? Well, we can look at the last National Defense Authorization Act, NDA 2013, uh, has a provision in there that legalizes propaganda. Propaganda, a program by governments to manipulate people's thoughts and opinions. The establishment solution to this terrible conspiracy theory problem was revealed by this man, Harvard Law Professor Cass Sunstein. In 2008, shortly before being appointed by Obama to the cabinet level position commonly referred to as the information czar, Sunstein published an essay out of Harvard Law School titled Conspiracy Theory. He prefaces the 30 page white paper with a warning that those who subscribe to conspiracy theories may create serious risks, including risks risks of violence and the existence of such theories raises significant challenges for policy and law. He writes that his objective is to understand the mechanisms by which conspiracy theories rise, spread, and prosper, whether to ignore or rebut a conspiracy theory, and to understand how such theories might be undermined, and to offer recommendations for governmental actions. Sunstein begins with the claim that conspiracy theorists typically suffer from crippled epistemology, meaning they know very few things things and what they know is wrong, and that they only hear the conspiratorial accounts. He doesn't provide any footnote or evidence that conspiracy theorists are more likely than others to get their news exclusively from one source, but he uses this false premise as his justification to rationalize his authoritarian proposals. Sunstein's admitted goal is for the government to eliminate conspiracy theories, but claims they will only do so if it improves social welfare. He considers several startling policies policy responses to dampen the supply of conspiracy theories, including having the government ban conspiracy theories, having the government tax conspiracy theories, have the government itself engage in counterspeech to discredit conspiracy theories, have the government formally hire credible private parties to engage in counterspeech, and have the government informally encourage credible private parties to help. You may be thinking, no way, the government would never actually ban or tax Americans' free speech that violates the First Amendment. But this constitutional law professor does not rule out banning and taxing conspiracies. He states that each instrument has a distinctive set of potential effects, cost, benefits, and each will have a place under imaginable conditions. And if a conspiracy theory became so pervasive and dangerous that censorship would be thinkable, wouldn't you just love to hear what circumstances Sunstein believes would justify repealing the First Amendment? Sunstein ultimately determines that his main policy recommendation is for the government to engage in what he calls cognitive infiltration. He defines cognitive infiltration as introducing diverse viewpoints and new factual assumptions into the hardcore extremist groups that propagate conspiracy theories. In other words, he wants government agents or their allies acting either virtually or in real space and either openly or anonymously to undermine the crippled epistemology of those who subscribe to conspiracy theories by planting doubts about their theories and thereby introducing beneficial cognitive diversity. Sunstein suggests that government agents and their allies enter chat rooms, online social networks, or even real space groups and attempt to undermine conspiracy theories by raising doubts about their factual premises, casual logic, or implications for political action. Adding that government officials would participate anonymously or even with false identities because government cannot be seen to control the independent experts. Although government government can supply these independent experts with information and perhaps prod them into action from behind the scenes, but too close a connection will prove self-defeating if it is exposed. When confronted about his Orwellian proposals by independent journalist Luke Radowski from We Are Change, Sunstein played dumb and claimed he didn't remember the article, implied that he didn't really write those things, yet he refused to retract his statements and said he's just focused on doing what his boss, the president, wants him to do. Where he openly advocated government agents infiltrate activist groups of not love truth and also stifle dissent online. I was wondering why do you think it's the government's job or why do you think the government should uh, go after family members who have questions about 9-11, responders who are lied to about the air, survivors, survivors whose testimony commits, and also government whistleblowers that were gagged. 
because they released information that contradicts the official story. Why do you think the government should do that? I think, as, as Ricky said, I've written hundreds of articles, and I remember some and not others. That one I don't remember very well. I, I, I hope I didn't say that. Um, but whatever was said in that article, my role in government is um, to oversee federal rulemaking in a way that is uh, uh, wholly disconnected from the vast majority of my academic writing, including that. So, I know that I was just asking because you may be the next Supreme Court Justice for a lot of points, and you did write those things, and that's why I want to bring them up to you. So, I, I, all I can say is that there are a lot of things that I've written, I've written, I guess, and there are even more things I've said to have written. And, uh, uh, I may agree with some of the things I've written, but I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> I focus on the. the what my boss wants me to do. I just want to know, is it safe to say that you retract saying that conspiracy theory should be banned or taxed for having an opinion online? Is it safe to say that? that or, I don't remember the article very well, yeah. so uh, I hope I didn't say either of those things. But it, you did, and, I, and it's written. Do you retract them? I'm focused on my job. So you're not retracting that? Do you still believe that? Do you still believe that? There's no, the, people shouldn't have freedom of speech. Hey, thank, thank, thank you so much. Yeah, so, I'm so, happy to talk about so, this, so, by the way. I can, I can go on the record. He's the, man, he's the man who wrote about it. So, so Cass, do you still believe in the Joseph please, Goebbels please don't, approach? Please don't. Please don't. I'm asking a question. I, I know, I know, but you're I'm asking a question. Just, you know, you know. Good. It's the job of a journalist to ask questions. Sunstein then runs away from the question like a coward. Pretending he doesn't remember the article is a bold-faced lie and an insult to our intelligence. The paper was already receiving a great deal of criticism at the time, and he even released a book shortly after titled Conspiracy Theories and Other Dangerous Ideas where he expanded on the paper. He should have just named his book Dangerous Ideas by Cass Sunstein, because nothing is more dangerous than promoting government censorship in covert propaganda. But when someone calls Sunstein dangerous, it's all a big joke to him. The great quote, which is on the back of uh, Cass's book, uh, it's from uh, Glenn Beck, and it says, Cass Sunstein is the most evil man, the most dangerous man in America. Bravo. That's. You, you can't do better than that uh, for, for, for an introduction. Despite the Orwellian policies in Sunstein's paper and the government's long history of secretly manipulating the media, any accusation that media figures may be covert government agents is dismissed outright. Changing the mind of conspiracy theorists is often very hard to do. It's true, and here's why that's a lie, and you're part of a conspiracy. And so it ended up that when you gave them evidence to the contrary, they believed the original theory even more. Conspiracy theorists believe that the agents of the conspiracy have unusual powers, so that apparently contrary evidence can be seen as a product of the conspiracy itself. They assume that's all just, you know, government plants or something. It's hard to, to fix it because they're, it has a self-sealing quality. Anything can be folded into the original conspiracy. Of course, the denial is part of the conspiracy. It's very hard to break a conspiracy theory. Joining me now is Harvard Law School professor and author of the new book, Conspiracy Theories and Other Dangerous Ideas, the man himself, Cass Sunstein. Cass, am I to believe it's you, or is it just a hologram that appears to be you? <laughs> well, I, it's me, but of course I would say that. Right, exactly. In your book, you write about just how hard it is to debunk conspiracy theories, because those who believe in them, and I will quote you, are unlikely to give respectful attention to the debunkers who, in their eyes, may after all be agents or dupes of those responsible for the conspiracy in the first place. Sunstein criticizes conspiracy theorists for suspecting that people in the media are government agents, yet that is exactly what he is proposing. His hypocrisy is astounding. Sunstein's recommendations for the government to cognitively infiltrate conspiracy theory groups online with government propaganda was evidently put into place by the United States Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. DARPA. In 2011, DARPA unveiled its Social Media and Strategic Communication Program with a solicitation on FedBizOps.gov for innovative research proposals and emerging technologies to improve its methods of detecting and conducting propaganda campaigns in social media. Through the program, DARPA seeks to develop tools to help identify misinformation or deception campaigns, encounter them with truthful information, reducing adversaries' ability to manipulate 
simulate events. They are basically asking for new technologies to carry out Cass Sunstein's call for cognitive infiltration of conspiracy groups. However, the concept of manipulating public opinion with online propaganda did not originate with Sunstein. It is a common propaganda tactic practiced by governments and corporations around the world. It has been reported that Israel pays college students to promote the Zionist agenda. China pays commenters to spin bad news to shape public opinion. Russia also has their army of trolls. Even Canada is involved. So is it okay to have the government monitor social media conversations and then to wade in and correct some of those conversations? In 2014, NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden leaked documents to journalist Glenn Greenwald. The leaks contained presentation slides from the United Kingdom's government communications headquarters, which is the British equivalent of the NSA. The documents reveal that the government has been systematically attempting to control, infiltrate, manipulate, and warp online discourse through a previously secret unit known as the Joint Threat Research Intelligence Group, or JTRIG. The document received from the Joint Threat Research Intelligence Group is, quote, the art of deception training for online covert operations. Oh boy, this ought to be good. They've got the memos internally from how they do it, and of course, the five eyes all participate in this intelligence gathering operations together. So if Britain does it, as they're doing it here, will they share the information and uh, uh, with the US and the other five eyes? Yes, and if you don't know the five eyes, that's the US, Britain, New Zealand, Australia, and Canada. It's what they call themselves. It's their intelligence groups working together. Hey, what can you do in Britain? What can you do in Australia and America? How can we violate each other's laws without having to do it ourselves and get our hands dirty? In this case, they do it with propaganda. And people have <laughs> crazy conspiracy theories. They have a manual for how to do it. Using uh, online techniques to make something happen in the real or cyber world. Information ops, influencer disruption, technical disruption, known in GCHQ as online online covert action, the four Ds, deny, disrupt, degrade, deceive. Under the title online covert action, the documents detail a variety of means to engage in influence and info ops, as well as disruption and computer net attack, while dissecting how human beings can be manipulated using leaders, trust, obedience, and compliance. In other words, they have a manual on how to get you to bow your head. And one of the keys to that is to get trusted leaders in the media to say, no, no, this is right, the government is right, now everybody, comply! In this slide, you'll see highlighted conspiracy stories, uh, you know, uh, plant some of those online, etc. Use, uh, on the right-hand side, you see hindsight bias, confirmation bias, anchoring and priming, priming targets to believe a certain thing, and then confirm their bias already, etc. They have all these psychological tactics to get you to believe things that aren't true, but my favorite is at the bottom there, propaganda branding, marketing. They know they're doing propaganda. They have a manual that says do propaganda in the media. And one of the things they do is they get thought leaders in the media to totally agree with the government, use compliance, obedience, and social networks. This is propaganda 101 manual. We've literally got it now. Now we know exactly what the government's up to. So when you see this online, <laughs> know that that's exactly where it comes from. It's scary stuff, man, that this is what our government is now doing. The British government and all the five eyes that cooperate with them. Big Brother is here and he's got some unbelievable propaganda ahead